five minutes uh, behind the printing schedule that we were on this morning, and that should all be great. We've got plenty of slack later on that we can make it up with. And uh, it is a pleasure um, to be here uh, chairing this session, and we'll start off with uh, Diana Litterman. Okay, well, I don't um, a pleasure to be here, uh, not only to celebrate Linda, but to try to remember my lost youth, because I spent, uh, I think, almost three years here at NCAR as a graduate student, and then briefly as a postdoc. But I want to mainly talk about Linda. I want to find out if I've known you longer than anybody else who's here. No. Okay, there's two people who beat me. You've known her since she was that big. Yeah, I, I think I first met Linda in 1980 uh, when I arrived at uh, UCLA as a PhD student. Um, and we were both at UCLA. I think Linda was a master's student and I arrived from Toronto uh, where I'd worked with uh, the sort of previous generation of climate impact geographers, mostly uh, Ian Burton, who's still around. Um, and that photo up there is Bunch Hall. Um, the trees were, which is where the geography department was at uh, UCLA. Um, it terrified me, even though it wasn't very high. I, you know, came from a place that didn't have earthquakes and I would sit in the, my office at Bunch Hall and think about what would happen in an earthquake. I heard it was earthquake proof, but, and the, uh, the palm trees were much smaller. I'm not even sure if they were even there. Um, but Linda and I from UCLA onwards had sort of parallel lives, I guess. Um, we both ended up doing our PhDs at NCAR. Um, we shared three of our committee members, I think, Steve Schneider, Werner Terjung, and Margaret Fitzsimmons, and I'll come back and talk a little bit about those. And then ever since, we've seen each other regularly in different venues, often at the Association of American Geographers meeting, where Linda has uh, received a Distinguished Scholar Award, but also as IPCC authors. And I'll talk a little bit about that, though some of the rest of you may as well. So in some way, I consider Linda my intellectual sister, because we had the same PhD parents. And so one of the things, Linda, is as my sister, you may lay, 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 lay claim, uh, you haven't been in a position where you, like in a university position where you would have tons of students, you've mentored really important people um, as members of the committee or as uh, younger scientists here. But I've got 75 uh, nieces and nephews that you're welcome to. Um, many of them who I forced to read your work or who wanted to read your work. And many of them, like Karen O'Brien or Hallie Eakin or Max Dilley, who you have interacted with uh, over your career. And I have one request because I still suggest that students read your work. And when I ask students to read somebody's work. I like them to read a career worth of work and you don't have a Google Scholar profile. So I have one request that you, that she has a Google Scholar profile because then people can see all of Linda in one place. She's looking like she doesn't even know what a Google Scholar profile is, which, no. You don't, and it made it much harder to prepare some of this uh, talk. Um, thank you. Um, so we share uh, PhD advisors. Um, we were geographers, as Bill pointed out, of a particular generation. I do want to mention the climate impact geographers that were the generation above us or you know, before us, not above, we were above them, but before us. And we've mentioned a couple of them. I mean, Bob Cates was very important. Gilbert White, Boulder's very own Gilbert White was an inspiration to our generation of geographers, particularly 
the way in which his work on hazards influenced our work on climate impacts. Um, Jill Yeager, who was Jill Williams when she was in Boulder and a student of um, Roger Barry, who also, uh, Roger was ahead of the game in training uh, women climate scientists. He, uh, I think Anne Henderson Sellers worked with um, uh, Roger Barry as well. Um, and then of course, two people who Linda and I both interacted with a lot through IPCC, Martin Parry, um, a British geographer who became uh, head of working group two. And I think probably Linda and I both, you know, tortured in our own ways, um, trying to push him to things we were interested in. And then Ian Burton from University of Toronto. So I wanted to mention uh, that uh, generation. A uh, couple of other things. Um, Linda's my sister, but she's a cat person and I'm a dog person. Um, and, ah, uh, yeah. Well, I have a picture of you with Leo, which shows that you're not completely cat oriented, but I do remember staying with you and being warned that there were a lot of cats. But I think I was given the cat's room when I stayed with them, but they weren't in there. Um, Okay, so I want to uh, talk a bit about Linda as a graduate student. And so this is a photo of Linda being Linda, uh, probably back in about 1980. Um, the chap with the loud shirt is Werner Terjung, who was a climatologist at UCLA. And Werner passed away just a few months ago. And this photo came around and I thought, yes. Uh, and I believe, Linda, if I can get this right, is that Larry Band next to you? And then uh, that's Patricia O'Rourke, Werner, John Hayes, and Paul Todd Hunter, who were all part of the Turgeon lab at UCLA. And Werner liked to you know, take us all out once in a while to Will Rogers State Park in Los Angeles. But he had a very limited palate. It would be Coors beer and Kentucky Fried Chicken. That was it. And I don't remember anything else. I only went to one of them. So, oh, lots of bees. Yes, the bees would attack us. That's right. Um, so I know from Linda and that she started at the University of Wisconsin and Paul Robbins said hi. I posted that I was coming here and I've got a few messages from people. Paul Robbins now directs the Institute for Environment there but remembers Linda um, as a geographer but also an alum and Linda did a degree in philosophy. Uh, she was also a student activist in the anti-war movement uh, she then took time and spent time in France, so she speaks French um, beautifully. But then before I met her, came and I don't know much about that interlude, uh, she came to UCLA as a grad student, I think in 1979. And what I found amazing and have forgotten is that Linda has always cared about climate variability and agriculture. Her master's... Uh, was simulating the effect of climate variability on wheat yields in Australia. And I think the way Werner worked would be, he would hand out, he was very interested in us getting into crop modeling and he would give us places and crops. So, you know, some of us did wheat, some of us did corn, some of us did rice, some of us did Great Plains, some people did Australia. So perhaps Linda will tell us whether she was handed Australia or chose Australia um, for her masters. Um, okay. So these are a couple of Linda's very early publications from the uh, 1980s. Um, this is all based on, one was sort of a lone wolf in geography. He was, um, wrote a, a very important paper on 
the importance of a systems approach to understanding climate. He started off more with sort of energy balance modeling, but then got very interested in uh, climate and crops. And so here's a, a paper from 81 uh, from the uh, grad student team. And Werner was also amazing. At that time, I would say not many advisors put their students on their papers, particularly as lead authors. And I believe I could say that Werner was almost gender blind. The department we were in at UCLA was a somewhat notorious for male faculty harassing students. And Werner was totally a safe space to be in terms of the respect with which he treated uh, all of his graduate students. And then this is um, on the right is one of the earlier papers uh, where I was given maize um, and worked um, with Werner and John and Linda uh, looking at the impact of climate change on crane corn, grain corn yields. And at that point, we weren't using GCMs or regional models or anything. We were using basically a sensitivity analysis. What would happen if temperature increased two degrees, minus two degrees? And I think it was usually precipitation plus or minus 20%. Um, and we weren't doing a lot in terms of looking at uh, other factors uh, such as technology. This is the infamous yield model. I couldn't get a uh, high resolution but this was the uh, crop model that uh, we built. And this is before we were interacting with um, other crop modelers like Cynthia Rosenzweig or Jim Jones or others. So uh, this is the one that uh, we built from scratch. We all had to program in Fortran. Um, and uh, I was, I come more from the sort of human geography side. I had great admiration for Linda and Jim Burt and others who were good programmers and had more sort of statistical insights. We had enormous amounts of problems getting uh, the input data. Now, Linda was finishing her master's. And meanwhile, after the first year of my uh, PhD, I think I got an email from Dick Warwick, who was a scientist in the environmental and social impacts group here at NCAR, saying, you know, we have this graduate fellowship program. We don't have many social scientists. And I had met Dick through Ian Burton, you know, all these complicated networks. And he said, why don't you apply to have a fellowship with the advanced study program at NCAR? And I was fortunate. I succeeded in getting that fellowship, I came here to work with Dick Warwick on drought. Dick then fell in love with someone and disappeared to New Zealand. So I was left without uh, an advisor at NCAR and in what completely changed my life and subsequently Linda's probably, is that uh, Steve Schneider, who was the head of the advanced study program, uh, took me under his wing and I think this is what happened. Linda will correct us, or Rick will. Where's Rick? He's at the back. I think Rick and Steve had an idea for a project, and they needed a research assistant to come and work with them. And Steve asked me whether I knew anybody, and I said, well, there's this fellow student of mine at UCLA, and I think they interviewed her, and they offered her the job. Because the next thing, Linda announces, uh, I'm coming to NCAR for the summer. There was a problem in that at that point you hated flying. I remember a long discussion where maybe she almost didn't come because of her dislike of flying, but whether those of you in California gave her drugs or drink or whatever, she got on a plane and came uh, to NCAR to work with uh, all of the above, to work with Steve and Rick to work on climate variability and extremes and variability and crop yields. Um, and she then, as somebody else said, this changed her opinion about uh, doing a PhD. Uh, she then uh, did her PhD based from NCAR, but with Werner and uh, other UCLA faculty on her committee. 
And in 88, she was awarded uh, her PhD. I mean, I'll come back in a minute to the 1982 life in uh, Boulder. Um, but I left in 1983 to take a faculty position at the University of Wisconsin. So Linda was sort of left behind as the UCLA geography woman, whatever, here at NCAR. And um, that is her looking extremely cool at a barbecue up on the Mesa, I believe. And it was when they used to, uh, I think that's the back of Dick Warwick's head. I'm not sure who the other person is, but people used, I don't know if you still do it, where people race up the hill and there were bicycle rides, but I don't think Linda and I were doing either of that. We were sitting at the top drinking beer or uh, whatever. Um, so I think this is the main paper, Rick, that came out of that uh, summer's work. Uh, and look how generous, Linda's the lead author with a master's. I really respect uh, Rick and Steve uh, for doing that. Uh, and this was not really focused on agriculture, was looking at high temperature events and probabilities, but um, has uh, sort of uh, continued to be uh, an interest of Linda. And then I found your PhD dissertation online. And this is Linda, Opal, if you didn't know what the O was, Merns. And uh, it's UCLA 1988, Technological Change, Climate Variability and Winter Wheat Yields in the Great Plains of the United States. And there is her committee with uh, Susan Beatty and then three people who we sadly no longer with us, Margaret Fritzen and Steve Schneider and Werner Terjan. And I share those uh, last three as mentors and uh, close friends. Uh, just thought, you've seen tons of these, so, but this is out of Linda's dissertation. And I do remember how incredibly hard it was to uh, construct uh, these sorts of graphics back there in the early 80s. Um, I'll talk a bit about the farm in a minute, but we had dial-up modem. It would take me half an hour to do an XY graph, even when you were here at NCAR, I don't think we got access to the Cray computer. We were, it was really clunky uh, trying to produce these sort of graphics. Uh, so I do want to take a minute uh, to on, honor Werner, Steve and Margaret. Uh, as I already mentioned, Werner was a climate scientist at uh, UCLA who I think by taking climate science and modeling very seriously, uh, changed uh, me and Linda's lives. So I drifted away from the modeling community when I started to do qualitative field work, trying to understand farmers' vulnerability. Fortunately, Linda stuck with it. Everybody at NCAR, I think, knows how important Steve Schneider was to generations of scholars and students, to IPCC, to climate communication. And Linda and I both became very close to Steve uh, over the years, saw him not long uh, before he passed away. I think it was 2010, it's a long time now. And I uh, don't know if Chris is here, but um, she was uh, very important uh, to that. And I still um, remember a lot of things Steve taught me. I do remember when I first came here, him up in the office on the fifth floor, and you'd be having a meeting with him and if ever a journalist called, the meeting would be over while he talked to the journalist, even if they were from a tiny little newspaper. Sorry, Lauren, I know you used to work for a tiny little newspaper, but Steve loved talking to the media, but by listening to him talk to them, you could uh, learn a lot. And then Margaret Fitzsimmons uh, was a geographer at UCLA and then in environmental studies at Santa Cruz. Um, and was a Marxist geographer. She took a political economy approach to the environment. She wrote a very influential paper called The Matter of Nature. And both Linda and I uh, became influenced by Margaret. She worked on agriculture. Her work, uh, her PhD was on the Salinas Valley in California. And sadly, we lost Margaret actually a year ago yesterday. So 
I'm remembering uh, Margaret. She's amazing. She's left um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, support early career scholars in the Association of American Geographers. So I just wanted to honor those three people who were so important to me and Linda. So just a little bit of how we lived back then when we were graduate students. Um, Nick Halburn, who was a geography professor at the University of Colorado and his wife, Susie, uh, back in the 70s or 60s, um, bought uh, an old farm up on Nelson Road, um, you know, between what was then the Green Bay Restaurant and Longmont, and it was a commune. And they converted a lot of the outbuildings. There was a converted hen house. But this house was the original farmhouse from, I think, the 1890s. By the time uh, I moved to Boulder and Linda moved to Boulder, they were renting properties uh, to people out on Nelson Road. And um, I rented um, this farmhouse and I was looking for roommates. And so when Linda came out and also Sally Marston, who's a very well-known human geographer who did her degree at CU, me and Linda and Sally shared uh, the house or the farm on Nelson Road. It was freezing in the winter. It had like one tiny little wood stove. So I remember you can see them, I think hanging in the windows. I made window quilts to try to warm it up. We, we made window quilts. Okay, we did. We made window quilts together. The other thing is that because it was a very old farmhouse, the doors were very low. And Linda and Sally, I believe you were both over six foot tall at the time. You may have shrunk a little bit, but maybe not. Oh, you've grown. Okay. So they were constantly at risk of uh, banging their heads. Um, there were a lot of mice. And then infamously, Nick, there was a shared vegetable garden. And uh, you had to be careful because Nick used to like to garden naked. And so we would always like do a warning before we went out to uh, pick strawberries. But um, the, the picture on the left is from when we lived there. The picture on the right is it's still there. I found it on uh, Google. So... Um, a lot of things happened on the farm. Yeah, Linda's wearing a skirt. Um, but it was a wedding, and that's uh, Sally Marston uh, there. And we hosted Sally's uh, wedding on the farm. I think her family was a little shocked uh, because it was quite farmy. Um, but, uh, you know, what do they say? Fun times. And amazing views. Um, and I thought about the one on the left. This is actually from the driveway of the farm, looking out over the Great Plains. And I think perhaps that was an inspiration to Linda. And there's a lovely picture uh, from the fall. I was trying to remember whether Linda and I drove to, into Boulder to Encore or not together. And then I think I remembered that I was a morning person and you weren't. So I would get up and leave like maybe at eight. And then Linda would turn up maybe at midday, but she would work till late at night. So I think we actually didn't see each other very much because we were sort of working on different time zones. So with that, I'm going to uh, finish up. Uh, I like to see Linda um, on regular occasions. Uh, so the one on the left actually shows most of the dog. Um, a couple of summers ago, I drove across the country and one of my stops was uh, Boulder. And then on the right is a get together of really amazing women, many of them climate researchers, which was on the occasion of my own retirement, which uh, Linda and Jenya came to. And there's Meg Mills Navoa, who's an uh, assistant professor at Berkeley, myself, Amy Glassmeyer from MIT, Jenya, Linda, Karen O'Brien from Oslo and Maria Carmen Lemos from Michigan. And I am so honored to be part of this sisterhood. And I think some of you know that I've been so inspired by being part of the community of women climate scientists with Linda 
that a few years ago, I persuaded a PhD student that we should start studying women in climate science. And so we did a study of gender issues in the IPCC, which shows that when Linda and I first were part of IPCC, women were, I think, about 8% of the authors. On the recent assessments, I think for the 1.5 report, it was up to 38% and improving. And um, I do want to mention that my Facebook post about coming to the symposium prompted some uh, good wishes from people. So Colleen Vogel, Emma Archer, Teresa Cavazos, um, Lisa Gramlich, all want to wish you best wishes. But the one for me that was most moving, and you'll know why, was Svetlana Krakowska. So Svetlana is the Ukrainian climate scientist who was part of IPCC, um, and Linda and I both worked with her. And Svetlana was in an IPCC meeting when the bomb started falling on Kiev. And that was um, really like, I don't know, emotional moment for a lot of us. Uh, she's doing okay, she's still in Kiev, she's still fighting to keep climate science going in Ukraine during the war. So Linda, be better at retiring than I am. And thanks for all the fun and the laughs and being a sister, thank you. Talk is remote, I understand. Our next yeah. talk is remote from Cynthia Rodney. Yep. Uh, uh, if you can go ahead and try to share your screen, I think they'll give you permission to do that. The um, I have to start with a disclaimer that I'm giving this talk as a private citizen and not as a NASA employee. And uh, maybe from looking at this first slide and the other <laughs> slides, you're, you can uh, see why. <laughs> so I want to explain the um, title. So the variability of variability. So the second variability is, of course, Linda's great contribution to all of us working in the field of climate impacts to keep a laser focus on variability, not just mean changes. So that's the second variability. But the first variability has to do with the climate in Washington, DC. And that had a lot of variability as we as we work together actually now through the decades. Um, and there were times when it was, things were a lot more warmer and welcoming for climate impacts. And uh, we all know in climate uh, change in general. And then there were uh, times in uh, uh, DC from DC they, that there that things were really a lot uh, colder. So um, the timeline, uh, as I go through the talk, you can see along the bottom um, uh, whether it was a, a, a relatively uh, warmer or cooler climate in regard to um, in in regard to climate change impacts. So next slide, please. Um, so starting out way back, so I I met Linda, I believe, when uh, when we uh, worked to, work, we were both working on what really um, I consider to be the first uh, a climate change assessment yeah. for the United States. So um, this was thirty five years ago um, uh, in the first Bush administration. Uh, it was led by EPA, Dennis Turpak, really very really visionary. Um, a person and was a uh, leader um, there, program manager in uh, in DC, and um, and also then there had been a request from Congress as well to um, to begin to look at the impacts of climate change, uh, see its impacts, potential effects. Um, on the United States. So Linda came right on board. The, I, I think that's when we first met um, uh, on climate variability. See, here's variability right from the very beginning. It might also have been like, at the, you know, there were times through this hot and cold periods where, as you all know, we weren't really able to even use the words climate change. And this might have been one of them. And that might have been why they were uh, asking Linda to lead the chapter on climate variability. And um, on the right is the chapter 
um, uh, that um, that I helped to lead. Um, and so really right from the beginning, we, we see that we, and we found that we shared interest, not only in the uh, climate and climate impact side, but then also on agriculture. Uh, so we're now up, by the way, to the we're now up to the fifth nas official national climate assessment. But I, I really believe that this was the actual first one. So the next slide, also during um, during the uh, first Bush administration. So uh, after we met, we realized that we had uh, very strong research interests um, that we shared strong research interests. So we launched in to be, go beyond the assessment to do a series of papers about exploring the effects of variability, um, climate, climatic variability on, um, uh, uh, on uh, agricultural crops. So you can see this is back in the day, right? 1992, we were still with sensitivity tests. Yes, double CO2, remember all that. Um, and you can also see how uh, how early on they weren't even called global climate models yet. They were for a long time called the G the C of the GCM stood for um, uh, the uh, to general circulation as opposed to the uh, global climate models. But really, this shows very very much how early on Linda really um, emphasized the importance of considering both the mean and the variance changes of the climate variables and the variance of those um, and the magnitudes of those variance changes. And um, this was for two sites, another part of the, um, uh, her geographical background, of course, always a very, um, very keen interest in actual sites and agricultural regions. Next, please. So this, then we continued the series. Oh, and we want to, um, uh, Linda, I just really also want to um, really do a shout out to Rich Goldberg, who worked with us just absolutely concertedly as a technical programmer, me meteorologist and crop modeler um, to help us get make these happen. So this is also a, a, a shout out to, um, to Rich Goldberg, who helped us in, with these papers. So the first paper was on the interannual variability. And then we went on, of course, delving deeper and deeper, as Linda always does, to uh, look at uh, not only interannual variability, but daily vari variability as well. And uh, so, and this is also looking at um, uh, aspects of crops, not just crop yield, but um, evaporation, um, evapotranspiration, soil water, and, for, and leaf area index, for example. So we really were de delving in to the processes that were being and how they were being affected by these changes in variability. Uh, next, please. So then now we're uh, moving into now the uh, Clinton-Gore administration. And um, uh, Diana mentioned, of course, that we all very, very early on became involved with the um, IPCC. And I know Richard, um, Richard Moss is um, attending virtually, and um, he, Richard also has a very, had a very strong role to play in this group that Linda and I were founding members of. It's called Tajika. It was originally called Tajika, the IPCC Task Group on Data and Scenario Support for Impacts and Climate Analysis. And uh, that's now been renamed TG Data. That was re renamed in 2018. And I I think that this program in which we were and also originally also founded by Martin Perry, whom uh, uh, Diana also mentioned, is this this realization that it can't only be um, just for the folks who are at NCAR and GIST, let's say, you, that to really make the tools for climate impact analysis broadly available. And uh, we worked on not only the actual nuts and bolts of the um, of the um, uh, uh, dissemination of these results, but also lots and lots of work on guidance. And I think Linda, uh, as always, stepped up and did um, uh, guidance on the downscaling techniques uh, um, uh, uh, and these um, and these variability techniques. But I think especially the downscaling there. 
So um, that, um, and I think this was forerunner to, for example, now the IPCC atlases that are now really part and parcel. And I think sort of I, IPCC in a certain way sort of caught up with Tajika that things that we were doing. Um, the, the main working groups, I, I think, caught up with what we were doing um, in Tajika all along. So next, please. Back to our, our set of series of papers. Um, here again, delving always deeper. Linda always, always goes further, asking deeper and deeper questions. So here we were looking at aspects of, well, how does this, how do these effects um, the responses and how do the effects actually come about? And so then, you know, it gets start getting really complicated because how near is the crop uh, being grown near its envelope of, um, it's, it's like biophysical envelope for the crop. How, what are these relative sizes of the mean changes and the variability changes and the timing of these changes? So for example, some of the work, we, you know, it's obvious, we, um, if it's a winter wheat, um, it, uh, whatever happens in the summer, which sort of people would be thinking, oh yeah, what's gonna happen to um, droughts in the summer, for example? Um, and, um, but of course with the winter wheat, it doesn't matter. So, or matter very much. Um, so just can always, um, really as the real research leader on this series of papers, always, um, uh, uh, leading us to ask deeper and deeper questions. Why, why are these, why are the effects happening? So next one is... Now, this is now turning to the second Bush administration. And um, what I wanted to emphasize here is this paper is with the big E group, the economists. So, um, so of course, the climate part and the biophysical crop part is very important. But agriculture is a, it has the human part also that um, Diana was raising. And it, as of course, agriculture is a livelihood um, as well as a physical and bio, biophysical process. So some of, we had some great, great times with of course, John Riley, colleagues, John Riley and Bruce McCarl, um, who are real, um, very good, uh, very colorful for, for, uh, economist colleagues. Um, but you can see also bringing together um, and this has been more and more the movement, I think, in our field um, of impacts of climate change on agriculture and food to then broadly um, include ecologists like Dennis Ojima, Keith Paustian on soil carbon, uh, Susan Reha, water specialist from Cornell, um, and everything, this proliferation of the, um, of the key processes uh, also become very important as do the regions. So this is showing the uh, effects across the regions of the United States and, um, and leading to the changes to agricultural practices. Because one of the things that always would keep being quoted at us was, there were no, there's no such thing as a dumb farmer. And so the farmers, of course, are not just going to, don't just say, oh yeah, oh, the farmers, the, 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 the uh, climate is changing. What are we going to do about it? They all, they, they have autonomous adaptation. They have, um, and then of course, now having to do even more beyond autonomous. Um, but this recognition, beginning to have recognition that, um, that adaptation was also very important. And this then became also part of the studies. So the next one, I think we're going to be moving um, to, and this Richard, again, I wanted to give a big shout out to Richard, um, because during the second Bush administration, there was, um, um, uh, for a while, there, there, so there wasn't going to be an, a, a, a uh, another national assessment the way that that we had all been gearing up to do it there instead there was a series of reports that was or that was were organized um at the net for the national level and at first they had numbers they they weren't even <laughs> they, <laughs> Richard please verify in the chat that, that my, my memory on this is correct but they wouldn't even call them like this is a climate change assessment 
it was like, are you, well, I, we're working on reports like, you know, 12B. <laughs> That's what they, how they would describe it. This is what I'm saying about like the hot and cold, you know, uh, temperature from DC going sort of uh, cool, cooler and hot and hotter. And Linda and I when worked on a scenarios um, uh, chapter um, uh, with Ted Parsons and others. But and also I'm sure she joins me in doing a big shout out to Richard because Richard was this, Richard really played this very, very important role in between all of us who were like, come on, what are we doing? And right, and then dealing with um, uh, with the um, uh, administration officials. So Richard, thanks, thanks for all of that. Um, okay, let's go on. We didn't have, so I think that we had done our series of papers on that deep dive into the uh, changes in um, the variability. Um, and um, the, so these last few are a little bit different, um, but these are the things that, we, that we've that uh, we worked together a little bit more recently. Um, so first of all, the, the embrace of impacts, I think, uh, while well, we had seen it also early on, but really more and more, um, there's the recognition of how important the climate impacts are. And so uh, one of the things that, um, I, uh, that Linda and I were part of, again, I think getting off the ground um, and now being now very much carried on um, to great effect uh, by Alex Ruane, um, who's the co-leader of the Climate Impacts Group at GIS with me, um, is this, what's called the VX, uh, VXAB, which stands for Vulnerability, impacts and adaptation. And I hope, Diana, you realize at least that vulnerability is in the right place this time as opposed to in the IPCC. Um, and climate services as well. So, um, and then this is now linked and advising the AB part is advising, this was to CMIP6. And of course, Alex is right in there right now as maybe some of you here there in the audience are already you know deep in the CMIP7 uh, discussions. But we can see from the, um, uh, from the graphic here, the infographic, this, the use of the climate models really to be linked to vulnerability impacts adaptation and the climate service is, this is all really so much now as the, uh, as the uh, climate for climate change, um, of course, as now um, so much um, warmer all, all around the world. Um, so let's go to the next one. So, um, uh, the point I want to make here, and I just have a couple more slides, is that I think that Linda and I both benefited so greatly from being in the climate science center. So Linda at NCAR, and then I'm, uh, I've spent my whole career at GIS, home of GCMs. It's not only the home of the GCMs and the model development for the GCMs, but also the use of the observations, but also the use of the models. So in some ways we've learned, I think so much, it's been so fertile for our work uh, to learn from all, all of uh, what's going on with the climate science colleagues. So thank you for that. Um, and so an example of this is AGMIP, which uh, sort of looked at, we were going, yeah, we looked at what CMIP was all about. And we said, oh, okay, well, you know what? Let's, we need this for the impact models to become more rigorous in the impacts. So it's not just one model, but let's now do multi-model and bring multi-model ensembles together. And that's really what, what AGMIP is all about. It's proliferated in, in many areas, but that's really, really taking, taking the lesson learned from, um, from the climate scientists and CMIP. So Linda got played a very key role. Sorry, wait one second. Just want to do the do the paper itself. So uh, Linda Co was a very important uh, co-author on um, on a paper that really looked at lessons from climate modeling on the design and use of ensembles for crop modeling. This was not an easy paper to write, um, but so but Linda, thanks so much for hanging in there um, on this paper because it's it's very foundational to the work of AGMIP. All right, I think we have uh, one more on the timeline and then the final slide. Um, so um, 
the most recent thing that Linda that uh, Linda and I collaborated on was a uh, volume in order in honor of Martin Perry, whom Diana mentioned. Um, it's called Our Warming Planet. And Linda, you know, bl bless her heart, you know, how many times has she um, you, done webinars, outreach on downscaling climate information? And I just really want to say thank you so much. It's all on YouTube um, with Linda giving her talk on the webinar. They were very, they, it's, they were very, very well received and uh, with a wide audience. And so that was, you can see kind of on the cusp um, between um, coming coming into the current administration and which, and of course we all know um, the climate for a climate change has been uh, very, very, very um, favorable um, in, um, in the current administration. So I think the last slide is late nights. <laughs> so, uh, this is um, uh, wherever we would go for all these uh, panels and assessments and reports, and not only the IPCC, all the US ones. Uh, we I just pulled together a few of the places where we met all over the world. And there's people here who I think Bill Easterling is there. And he was at the one, certainly with, with the one that's working group two, AR4, Great Barrier Reefs. Uh, that uh, was a wonderful meeting that we were all at together. Of course, many at WMO in Geneva, of course, Washington, D.C. a lot. I didn't put Cairo on, but we had an amazing trip together also at a, at a climate change and agriculture conference in, um, in Cairo. Um, uh, what I want to say is at these late nights, at the at the end of the whole day of presentations and discussion and breakout groups, et cetera, Lynn and I would always meet. And through the through through this entire timeline that I just went through. And she invariably was so supportive of me and and my research, my career. So I just want to give a very, very big thank you. To Linda for that. I have one more anecdote, and that's going to be it, which is the one on um, the right end car. So of course, Linda invited me and uh, for uh, various meetings, but uh, lots of times I've been t visiting end car. Not too much recently, but but earlier, and. Um, one time there was a workshop that Linda organized. I think it was on scenarios. What else? And uh, I was sitting in the audience. I think Linda maybe was giving a talk to someone else. And yeah, I think Linda was giving a talk. And one of the senior scientists, I'm not going to say who it was, but he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Linda has kept climate impacts and the research on climate impacts going in this country. So that's my final thank you to you, Linda. Thanks a lot, uh, great to be here. Um, so uh, unlike many of the talks that you've heard so far today, Linda and I have actually not formally collaborated a lot um, in terms of you know actual papers that we've published together. But Linda has taught me so much over the years and she's had such an influence on how I think and who I am as a scientist that that's really, I think, always been an undercurrent uh, in my career. But when I first arrived here at NCAR in the early 90s to work with Filippo and Gary, Christine, um, uh, building regional climate models, I was absolutely not ready to hear what she had to say. Um, we had we had many long discussions, many arguments about many of these things, and it it really took me a very long time to hear what it was that she was saying and what I was missing about not thinking about people in in the space that I was working. You know, I was a hardcore climate modeler. That's what I did, um, and and it was Linda's engagement with me and not giving up on me that um, led to my final embrace of what has actually become the focus of my career. 
And so, so while I'm not going to be talking a lot about papers that Linda and I did together, um, what I do want to do is share a little bit about the work that I'm doing now um, with the observation that this work wouldn't have happened with, without those early um, collaborations and, and uh, long, long arguments into the night. Um, this is a photograph, actually, that Linda does not read Inuit, I don't think, or not as well as French. Um, uh, the, the one kind of big formal collaboration we had was actually uh, up in uh, northern Alaska where we were using our um, uh, regional Arctic um, climate model and uh, many other methodologies besides to uh, look at the impacts of climate change on, on the people of the North Slope of Alaska. Um, but, um, but I always liked the idea that she was reading this newsletter with utter confidence <laughs> to me. Uh, says a lot about Linda. Um, so, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about this project and I'm, as, as I do, I'll kind of reflect on, on how Linda's thinking has kind of influenced where I've gone with, with what I do, what I do. Um, and so starting with the, the six assessment report, as we all know uh, very well, and stories for me always start with sea ice or almost always start with sea ice. And so the simulation of sea ice in um, CMIP-6 was obviously much improved um, as, as each MIP advances. Um, however, you know, what we don't see is a, a reproduction of the observed sensitivity of the ice to the climate forcing in important ways. And some of those important ways include um, when the Arctic Ocean is first going to become sea ice free. And this is something we, we have many proclamations of when this is going to happen with great confidence in the literature. But really, there is, there is a large spread um, of understanding and even of understanding of what we mean by sea ice free. And um, one of the things that we do get from these uh, simulations, though, uh, which is part of this, this theme that I think we've heard in discussing about Linda's work of, you know, don't stop at the big picture, drill down to the details, because it's the details that, that humans respond to. And uh, so in this case, the, the details that I noticed was that there was a real consistency and a consistency we, we could explain in the physics of um, the sea ice losses occurring in summer primarily evacuating from the, the Russian and Scandinavian coastline and preferentially piling up in the Canadian archipelago where we, you know, we now understand is, is going to be, if, if, uh, if we have one at all, a, a, something of a refugium for um, ice dependent species in the Arctic. And so we do have some information and all of that information is certainly pointing to a very big picture that, well, the ice is going to melt, um, but the devil's in the details. But it's the big picture that many um, uh, actors in the Arctic are responding to. It's the big picture of the ice is going and climate warming is happening and it, it's accelerating that is leading to the race to the north. And so what we're seeing is rising expectations, um, not just for economic development, which is maybe the um, obvious uh, area, but also um, arenas for strategic exploitation, both for Arctic nations and um, uh, interested nations, um, and expectations for um, claims of sovereignty. We have now the, uh, the constitution uh, for the um, uh, Greenlandic people has been presented to, to their parliament. And, and so there is a, 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 a very um, pointy discussion right now on, on Greenland's independence from Denmark and, um, and with all of the ramifications that that will, will make, not just for the economy of the people of Greenland, a largely indigenous nation, but also, for example, NATO membership. And so there are many interacting um, effects of this idea of the potential of the race to the north. 
Um, but as I said, you know, the, the devil's in the details here and thinking about those uncertainties, thinking about the big spread in sensitivity of climate models for ice retreat, thinking about that geographic pattern of where we know that the ice is retreating and where it's going to be sustained, um, thinking about the uncertainties associated with that, that's really led to an orientation in the work that I do, which, as I said, is really informed by those early discussions with Linda and thinking about uncertainty and thinking about variability and how the details affect human action, to think about what knowledge is useful. If I'm a climate modeler and that's what I do and that's the knowledge I produce, what information is actually useful? Um, and so I want to give an example of how I do that based on this one use, use case, which is maritime accessibility. Because even if you drill down and say, we're just going to look at the Arctic, we're just going to look at sea ice, it's still really, really complicated, as you saw. You know, it, it could be NATO, it could be Greenlandic fish people, it could be tourism, it could be oil and gas exploration, it could be seabed mining. Um, so just looking at maritime accessibility. And so being able to navigate across the Arctic, you need to be able to do that in order to do all of these other things. Um, and so that's going to depend on uh, many different types of information. And so looking at models, and so this, this actually comes from... Um, so the sea ice map group uh, did an assessment of what they thought were, were the kind of best performing climate models in CMIP-6 specifically for Arctic climate. And, and when you look at that, um, you come up with this list of 16 that we've got here. Um, and so this is, you know, this is our usual IPCC spaghetti that we've grown to know and love. There is large interannual variability in the projected season length, which is the kind of the minimum thing. When we talk to operators up in the Arctic, what they've told us is they need a 90-day season of reliable shipping in order to, for, for, for um, investing in polar class vessels to be economically worthwhile. So 90 days, that's our gold standard. Can we even tell them if there's going to be a 90-day season next year in 10 years? Um, what we see is that the interannual variability is large and it varies between all of the models. So there's no model agreement um, on that variability. And the spread in projections of when that 90-day season can be reliably achieved um, is large. And so we have some models in our you know, best-case cohort that are telling us we have reliable 90-day seasons now, which we don't. Um, and there are some that are saying that actually we're not going to have one by the second half of the century. And so that's not something that I would show uh, operations managers in the Arctic who are planning for, um, for what, their, um, what their ship investments are going to be, which is the kind of long-term decision that climate information could influence. You know, we're not doing pro seasonal projections of next year's season, but when they're buying ships, we could potentially give them useful information if we knew what to give them. Um, and then, of course, we have the choice of scenario pathways, and, and they do start to diverge, not at first, but, um, but they do eventually start to diverge. And um, there are irreducible uncertainties there. It doesn't matter how good our models are, we're always going to have, you know, those elements of the future that are unknowable. And then the fleet availability that I've been alluding to as well also includes irreducible uncertainties associated with things like icebreaker availability, um, uh, what the uh, IMO is going to require in terms of, um, in terms of uh, use of fuel, uh, and different types of fuels, what polar class vessels are available and how much they can carry and all of those kinds of things. And so well, we need a way to deal with our cascade of uncertainty. <laughs> I asked ChatGPT to, to 
visualize for me the Merm's cascade of uncertainty. And I actually gave it uh, the, the uh, third assessment report chapter that you wrote, the section about it. This is what ChatGPT thinks that you wrote in the third assessment report. I'm very happy to make this available to anyone who wants it. So this is how um, I've been trying to, to go about dealing with this. Um, one of the things is to think about how much does not knowing cost us? And, uh, and so that was really the, the first thing that, that we started to do uh, in my group was to, to look at the costs of different types of uncertainty for these decisions. And so um, this is a graph that's based on a, uh, a finance model of actually um, futures trading called the Black uh, Scholes model. And what it does is it estimates the cost of um, either getting more of the season length that you want to get or less of the season length that you want to get. Um, and the, the sharp line, the black line, is, um, is what's actually realised. And so um, what we can see is that the cost curve of the ensemble mean is lower than the cost curve of the mean ensemble. So that is, if you filter out the intermodal spread by taking an ensemble mean and then calculating the cost from that, you lose all of the information that has within it costs. And so we need to actually take account of that. And so using the multi-model ensemble mean underestimates the variance that operators will typically assume in their rule of thumb. And so what we find then is that interannual variability ends up weighing more than the intermodal spread in the cost estimates. And so that's starting to give us uh, something of a, a clue as to the types of information that we can then start to provide to the operators uh, to let them make these investment decisions. Um, but those decisions are also constrained by um, international um, uh, treaties and also common law. And uh, for, for the stuff I'm going to be talking about here, I'll, uh, I've been collaborating with Charles Norkey, who's sitting up the back. So if anyone has any questions about the law side, he's your guy. Um, but I'll try not to mangle it. Uh, so, uh, so all of those decisions are constrained by the Convention on the Law of the Sea. And so all of these demands, the economic demands for access that um, are being made by these operators, so these are associated with uh, through shipping of cargo, uh, domestic shipping of oil and gas um, and, and mines uh, around the coastline, tourists, uh, indigenous fish people, um, uh, search and rescue, all of those different activities uh, are all ultimately going to be constrained by, um, by the international treaty regimes of which they're a part because there is a lot of international space here in the Arctic. It's not all uh, territorial sea. And as sea level rises, that becomes even more complex. And so this became something else that came up in our discussions was that, um, well, even with all of this and say the ice goes, sea level is also rising. If sea level is rising, the baselines are changing. That changes where the, uh, the, um, our economic zones are and, um, and what, what uh, resources we can, we can access uh, where we can um, where we can uh, route our ships and all of those activities. And so what we realized is that there is a lot more that we can give our um, uh, our operators in terms of useful knowledge, actionable knowledge for decisions 
uh, if we also take account of not just the economic environment they're in, the regulatory environment they're in, but also the, the legal environment um, that they find themselves in. And, and so this is when I started then hitting up against the, the, the um, a collision between how I think as a, as a climate scientist and how lawyers think about climate, which is, which is um, really interesting. And I won't say lawyers are wrong. I, I would say that they are constructively and effectively ambiguous. And, and I, think that, I think that that's done on purpose because um, this is what gives you the wiggle room for negotiation. So I read this as a scientist, and this is Article 234, which was intended to address um, uh, the, the uh, jurisdiction over ice-covered areas um, uh, with a very particular focus on environmental integrity. That, that was originally the focus of this article. But I read this, and I see it's... It's talking about Article 234 applying where the presence of ice for most of the year creates obstructions. Well, as a scientist, it's like, well, what does for most of the year mean? How, how, mu how many months do you, do, are you talking about here? What is the presence of ice? How thick does it have to be? What concentration? Um, you know, is it icebergs or is it sea ice? You know, because icebergs and sea ice are treated differently. Um, and, and, so, and so for me, reading this as a scientist and thinking about what is the information that I can give you if I'm not even sure that we're talking about the same thing. And, um, and that becomes particularly interesting uh, in, in the current context as we go back to this geography issue, this, the, the way in which the ice retreat is... Um, is not happening uniformly over the entire Arctic, but is actually retreating most rapidly from the Russian coast. And so that detail now becomes really important because Russia is invoking Article 234 as a way of extending their enforcement jurisdiction to the Northern Sea Route, which they contend is internal waters and theirs to administer to um, require icebreaker escort by their icebreakers that you have to pay and you also have to pay the toll. And if you're, if you're a uh, government vessel, for instance, a, a US military vessel, only one at a time. And if you're a submarine, you have to surface. And you know, all, of those, all of those requirements um, are, um, are based on Russia invoking Article 234 as, as, um, as allowing it enhanced jurisdiction. But Article 234 is about ice-covered areas. So is that ice-covered or not? And that to, to a scientist, we can kind of be pretty specific and precise about this. Um, and, um, but as a legal matter, it's less obvious. So again, what knowledge is useful? And, and so this, this interaction between law, science, and policy um, uh, means that I had to start thinking about those climate scenarios and the fact that, you know, so I know we have a lot of intermodal spread. We have a large amount of intraannual variability that is different among models. We don't know what scenario we're on, and we don't know uh, which country is going to have access to which type of fleet. We don't know what kind of... Uh, fuel oil they're going to be allowed to, to use. Um, and, um, and then we have these emerging demands of non-polar states. And so, uh, so thinking about this made me think about asking the question in a different way. And, and this was what ultimately led to the question that I actually asked Charles as an international lawyer, which is, you know, would it be useful to know the likelihood of being able to navigate freely outside of Russian territorial waters. Is that actually the question I should be asking? And, and that's um, what led to this, 
which, you know, became a different way of thinking about the same data. So these are still the CMIP6 scenarios for the different, um, four different scenarios, 16 different models. Um, but the question that we wanted to answer, you know, guided by IPCC, but not constrained by IPCC, is what is the likelihood that uh, countries would be able to navigate us outside Russian territorial waters so that the idea of them invoking Article 234 becomes moot, um, which becomes particularly important at the moment, of course, um, because of sanctions um, to the Ukraine, that, um, uh, that, you know, most countries are actually not able to access this route anyway. Uh, because of sanctions, but there are there are countries that are not adhering to sanctions. Um, and so being able to do this meant that we were able to develop this picture of the likelihood that that kind of access, so that article two thirty four may become uh, may become not relevant anymore and and not a basis for Russian claims and when that might happen. And it's starting to happen, you know, pretty much agnostically uh, by, by scenario by mid-century, certainly on the planning horizons. And, and this, this graph actually led to a, uh, a, a call with a please explain from the, um, from the White House um, <laughs> after we, we published this. Um, so we were sitting in Ireland, um, on the west coast of Ireland, kind of talking to the White House about this about this graph, which led me to believe that I'm on the right track from 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 the standpoint of trying to think about climate science differently and trying to think about think about it from the decision back as opposed to this is my hammer, what nail can I hit, which was kind of the tradition that that I came from, and so. So just to kind of wrap that that up, um, so this is still very much an ongoing uh, research project. The the opinion the the context is evolving rapidly. You know we have issues associated with Russia, as we all know. We have issues associated with Greenland and their their quest for independence. Um, we have demands by other indigenous peoples uh, around the Arctic. In different ways, we have tourism operators. We ha we certainly have um, uh, resource exploitation, and um, and we have China uh, really uh, seeking to uh, become a serious Arctic player and investing heavily in that process. And so, what that leads to then is is the work that we're continuing to think about. Um, as we move into these new conditions, thinking about the routes that will be established, thinking about the renegotiation of baselines. So one of the one of the possibilities is that baselines will be frozen where they are now, regardless of where the water actually is, which again is this another nice kind of collision between how we think of it as scientists, which is what do you mean the sea level isn't rising, and how you need to think as a lawyer, which is it's actually more helpful if we just freeze this information. Um, but even with all of that, new claims will be asserted. And so this is very much a, a, a moving um, target. So, um, yes. Oh, <laughs> why? I love this shot. <laughs> is that anyone we know? No, that is not anyone we know. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I can't even remember where we got that photo. Russia. Yeah, it is Russia. Actually, there is, I've cropped it. There's a there's a big um, uh, kind of tundra um, truck behind him. So he's not standing out there in the ice. Cool. So, yeah. Oh, so, um, <laughs> the hat party. I don't know yes. if you remember the hat party. Um, but... Yeah, and so, you know, rather than kind of going back, it was interesting when I was asked to do this talk, you know, the thought was I'll talk about regional climate models and the work with Filippo and all that stuff in the 90s. But in fact, 
you know, for me, Linda's influence is now. And um, and it continues to influence my work. And I think that I'm a better scientist for it. I think I ask better questions. And I think it's because Linda pushes us to ask better questions. And so that's what I want to do. Yeah, I just have a quick question as someone not with this background, but what is the main way that China is sort of trying yeah, to insert really themselves? So, well, they, they because they're not adhering to sanctions, they, they actually freely use the Northern Sea Route and they can supply um, uh, payment for tolls and they will pay for the icebreakers. So they're continuing to do shipping through the Northern Sea Route. Um, there's also, because they're the main buyer of Russian oil now, um, the, the pipeline between Russia and China has been maxed out in volume. And so what they've started doing is taking small ships and that are not ice strengthened um, and filling them with heavy oil and shipping them along the sea route, even in winter, uh, between Russia and China, which should scare all of us. Um, and then the final thing they're doing is they're actually seeking into to invest in this new development of an Arctic railway, which would go from either Murmansk or perhaps northern Norway down through Finland and then through a tunnel, maybe through the Tallinn Tunnel or beside the Tallinn Tunnel into Eastern Europe. And so that would be a direct conduit over the top from China through the Arctic wow. down through the railway. And so they're investing in that wow. as well. And I'm sure there are lots of other things I haven't heard about. Good, good. Um, so, good day from Australia. Um, <laughs> you would hate the time I've had to get up this morning, Linda. Um, it's now 6.30 in the morning. Um, but um, I have to say, I am delighted to be able to give a talk at your symposium today. So what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit about all of my trips to NCAR and, and really sort of how you've influenced my career um, and particularly about thinking as, as everyone has today about uncertainty um, and then thinking about where I've got to now, which is really thinking about transdisciplinary approaches. And I think that, that a lot of this comes from your legacy in terms of the interdisciplinary work at, at ISI. So I first visited um, Issy and Linda in June 2005. Um, I'd been at a workshop over in um, Breck, Breckenridge, um, and had a, a ride back to Boulder with Rito Nutti, um, which was very, the first time I'd met him as well. And he was at, at the time doing an ASP um, fellowship at NCAR. And I had dinner with with him and his now wife at his um, apartment, which was again very nice. And then he took me over to um, the, the the hotel um, near Foothills, where where Linda had very generously um, paid for me to stay for a few days. Um, I'd contacted her because I was very interested in in visiting NCAR while I was over in Colorado. Um, at the time, I was um, doing work on downscaling. And particularly statistical downscaling and really thinking about um, weather generators and also um, as, as I show here this is the talk that I gave at ISI in uh, June 2005 um, particularly changing rainfall patterns and thinking about um, using regional climate models together with observations to think about um, climate change and I was particularly interested in the work that, that Linda and her group um, were doing it won't surprise you, however, to, to, to know that Linda wasn't the one who replied to my email. It was actually uh, Claudia. Um, so Linda has never been very good at, at replying to emails, and I, I'm sure that won't change. But, but it was wonderful to visit the group. Um, and I was so stimulated by both, I suppose, the environment in, in Boulder and um, Linda's group um, and the climbing as well, I have to admit, that um, I came back again and again over the next few years. Um, so just moving on. So I think this, this time was, was really formative 
actually in in the way I think and and continue to think and I I came over a number of times um between 2006 and um 2008 and and beyond actually and Lin Linda um Linda's group was fantastic so I come I did an undergraduate degree in geography and then moved into engineering and really was surrounded by by men and a very male dominated environment where I was working at Newcastle University um, by 2006, I'd won a, um, a postdoc uh, fellowship, um, which allowed me to travel and go and visit other groups. But um, it was really a breath of fresh air, Linda's group. Um, it was the first time I'd worked in a group that was mostly female, mostly women. Um, and um, it was it was collaborative um, and not not competitive in the same way that I was used to in the environment I, I, I worked in. Um, at Newcastle, it, it it was wonderful the way that um, there were there were meetings every week where people would share work and others would comment on on that that research. Um, and Linda would obviously be among um, the, the the best in terms of commenting on other people's research and really giving advice and really challenging people with with very deep questions about about where they were going in their research and and it. I mean, the interesting thing is, I suppose, that I try and mirror that in my own group today. Um, we meet every two weeks. Um, everybody um, is on an equal footing um, and and everybody shares their research. And we have a ch ch Chatham House rules um, where where people can share their research in a safe environment. And it really works. Um, and it's very collaborative. So I think that's something that I really took away from from the way that Linda works, um, this very collaborative sharing way of working. So she also really changed the way I was thinking about my fellowship. So my fellowship was very much based on um, looking at rainfall extremes um, in the UK and Europe um, and thinking about processes. Um, I think Linda convinced me that that actually I needed to think very much more about um, regional climate models and thinking about um, multi-model ensembles and uncertainty um, and trying to trying to then link those with um, very robust statistical analysis um, and with downscaling methods. Um, so during my visits to to NCAR over these three three years, she she linked me up with a number of really um, influential people as well who I've con worked with at the time. So you can see there that I gave a talk in 2006 um, where I'd set up a method looking at multi-model ensembles from the Prudence um, regional climate models, linking this up with a, with a rainfall model and a weather generator to really think about how do we downscale from multi-model ensembles and use different weighting methods to look at uncertainty as well at local scales. And um, Claudia Tabaldi was was very in influential, um, David Yates, Seth McGuinness, um, but other people like um, Steve Sane um, and Dan Cooley as well were, and, and Eric Gilliland were people that, that Linda put me in touch with um, and, and really brought that level of statistical rigor to my work um, that, that probably wasn't there beforehand as well, but really made me think in, in a different and, and, and more big picture way. Um, I have to admit though, um, I was trying to find some pictures of you, Linda, um, and of NCAR while I was over there, but I, all I found were pictures of me climbing um, and me um, walking and taking in the beautiful scenery um, in Boulder. So I, I think that uh, I, I was also, delighted to to be able to um, be part of that environment as well and I, I went a little mad and and climbed a lot while I was over there um so we we kept up this um, relationship after I returned to the UK in in 2008 in February um me and my husband got uh, now husband got engaged at the the day we got back um and um I then got married and had a baby the year later and I remember Linda ringing me up in um, February 2010 or something like that 
um, and saying, Haley, I've got this money and I'd like to run a summer school um, on based around uncertainty. And, um, you, you know, and I said, well, that that's great. This is in, um, she wanted to run a summer school in 2011. And I said, well, that, that that that'd be great. I'd love to love to be involved in in organizing that. But um, actually, me and my husband are thinking of having another baby. And she, in typical Linda style, went, "Oh, okay." Um, so, if you were talking about IPCC likelihoods, what would be um, the likelihood that this is going to happen in twenty eleven? Um, and so I said, "Well." Given given past experience, it's it's very likely actually that that I'll be having a baby in the summer of twenty eleven, and so very generously, Linda decided to delay the um, theme of the year symposium to twenty twelve, so I could be involved in in organising it. Um, and indeed, I did have my second child in twenty eleven. So instead, I um, came over to Boulder. Um, in 2011, and I'm actually pregnant in that picture there, although you can't tell because the jacket's so big. Um, and um, just to just to give a demonstration of of uncertainty, um, in in Boulder and in Colorado, snow is too dry to actually build um, snowmen. Now, me and my husband hadn't realised this because we'd obviously never tried to build a snowman in in uh, Colorado before. And that's my little son Evan there. He was kind of I don't know, 15, 18 months at the time. Um, so to actually build a snowman in Boulder, we had to um, take buckets of snow, add water from a hose pipe, and then build the snowman. Um, and I think that that lots of people had never seen a snowman before. It's, it's perhaps um, maybe just the way my husband built the snowman was a bit odd as well. But we had queues of traffic outside the house taking photos of the snowman as well. Um, and the other picture is of my little boy, Evan, where we, when we visited Linda, I couldn't find a picture of you, Linda, but I found a picture of Evan sitting in, I think it's Larry McDaniel's chair, actually, in his office. Um, and he used to, at the time, if you remember, um, he used to ask him, what do Americans say? And what do, and he used to say, awesome, which was quite funny. Um, so moving on, um, in 2012, and I'm not going to talk much about this because I know that Linda's going to talk about this in her talk later. Um, we we ran a summer school um, for the theme of the year in August 2012, looking at uncertainty and climate change research, very much um, led by Linda. And um, I think all that I really wanted to say about this, we did this again in 2014 as well, was that um, it would never have occurred to me at the time to actually bring this diverse mix of people together. But I think that's one of the, the fantastic things about the way Linda thinks um, is in this really big picture way. And she can see that these connections need to be made. And it's very much about putting decision making um, and impacts at that that the start of things rather than the end of things. And making sure that people think in in that different way is really important. Um, so, you know, we had, I don't know, but about 30 people, I think, at this first summer school. Um, and it was myself, Chris uh, Forrest and, and Linda who, who were co-chairing it. Um, and there were people from philosophy. There were people from, you know, geography. There were people from climate science. There were people from um, decision making. They were all early career, but... Um, all from very, very different backgrounds um, and really thinking about uncertainty. Um, and these people have, have gone on to forge um, really interesting careers, I think, and really think in different ways because of this. And I think this is this is part of Linda's legacy. We did this again. I'm not going to show a picture of the infamous uncertainty cake. I'm going to let Linda do that later. Um, but we did this again. You can see my kids there on the on the bottom right. Um, in 2014. Um, and really, um, people have come up to me, conferences, and, you know, I've done PhD vivas for people afterwards. Um, and you can see that people think in a different way. And, and, and really, the feedback is that, that people were 
think in a very different way from these type of 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 summer schools that that were run. And I, I think it, it would be a fantastic thing to think about um, doing this on a on a more regular basis since we we've not done it for a long time now. But it, it would it would be something that I think really makes a difference, actually, in terms of this educational piece and, and getting th people to think about um, integrating things in the big picture and really thinking from a decision making um, perspective, which is is something that that, that I, I do now very regularly and and certainly didn't do before um before visiting NCAR. So I wanted to just um move on and and talk very briefly about um some of the things that um I think oh about how how Linda has affected I suppose my my own thinking and my career. So it was um, it was in 2007 that I first met um, Lizzie Kendon, and actually I was over at, in um, in Boulder at the time, and went over to San Francisco for the AGU, and met with Lizzie Kendon, and I think the following year I went to a meeting in Exeter in 2008, and. I was thinking a lot about regional climate models at the time, and we'd done a lot of work on um, multi-model ensembles and really thinking about um, changes to rainfall extremes at the daily scale at the time, because there weren't any, there wasn't any model outputs below daily. And I saw a talk at, at this British Hydrological Society meeting in Exeter by someone from the Met Office, and they had just started running experimentally um, a 1.5 kilometer resolution weather forecast model and you could see that it provided much um, improved simulations of um, summer convective rainfall extremes in particular not just improving the intensity simulations but also the banding and the linear the linear structure um, convective banding that you get from the, some of these storms um, and I remember very excitedly going to see Lizzie um, the next day in Exeter and Richard Jones as well and suggesting to them that, and I thought it was a bit of a crazy idea, but suggesting to them that we should try and run a weather forecast model as a climate model. Um, and Richard was very excited and Lizzie, of course, made it happen. I couldn't have made it happen. Um, but, you know, the rest is history. So we started working on these convection permitting climate models. Um, we tried to get this funded a couple of times before we were successful. We we wrote an immediate proposal, of course. It was too, I suppose, too ahead of its time, um, like many of these things are. And we only got it funded in, in 2010. Lizzie forged ahead. Um, I went on maternity leave and, and then we continued to work on this um, when I was back. Um, but it's 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 interesting. It's you know it's really proliferated now, and I think that some of the thinking behind it really came from from all of that work that I've been doing on regional climate models, particularly over at NCAR. And it's really um, revolutionised climate modelling in terms of our ability to actually look at um, short duration extreme rainfall and and how that might change in the future. And this was obviously the first paper to do it. Um, and I suppose the other thing that that Linda taught me is is that um, and Claudia Cabaldi as well is is this this need for rigor and this need for 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 validation against observations as well, um, which um, I think translates into my work today and the work of my group as well. Um, they're very very rigorous statistically and very rigorous in terms of thinking about um, validation against observations, which many papers don't do and many groups around the world really don't think about, um, do, that don't do enough validation against um, against the real world when they, they look at climate modeling. The other thing that the, um, the convection permitting models have allowed us to do is really think about um, variability in extremes in a different way. And I think, again, um, this is this is something that um, that Linda really instilled in me at that time in NCAR is 
is this idea that variability is is incredibly important and and it's something that myself and, and Lizzie Kendon as well, um, we, we now very much, um, we don't look at the multi-model multi mean, we look at the, the uncertainty ranges and the, and the variability um, and really think about that and why, why are those models different? What are the drivers, et cetera? Um, and particularly at the moment, thinking about large scale changes and large scale circulation drivers. Um, but this paper here is really looking at um, looking at storms. And uh, I suppose the other thing that, that convection permitting models have allowed us to do is really move beyond thinking about um, statistical approaches and really thinking about physical processes. Um, so not just thinking about intensity changes to peak rainfall intensities um, in terms of intensity duration frequency curves, but actually thinking about the physical um, processes in in storms and how those might change and of course of course it's really important um that we look at total event rainfall rather than just peak intensities if we want to understand changing flood risk and i think that some of the recent events around the world have really shown that where we seem to be getting much bigger spatial rainfall events for example storm daniel in greece last year um that obviously went into libya and caused that devastating flooding um in Libya last year, but a peak intensity uplift is not going to give you that level of flooding. Um, you've got to understand also the duration and the spatial extent of that actual storm. The other thing that Linda really taught me is um, about decision making, as I've said already. Um, and thinking about, for me, um, I suppose I had a little bit of this mindset already before I visited NCAR, but um, it's very much research has to lead to the provision of improved climate change information for decision making. And I think that um, it also needs to align um, with risk assessment needs. Um, my big bugbear at the moment is that that we don't think enough about the research priorities that are actually needed at the moment for societal risks. And I think that we're gonna see more and more of this over the next few years. And we really need to start thinking more clearly about this type of thing. So Linda's really swayed my thinking towards um, working very much more closely with partners. I remember being, being introduced to a number of different stakeholders at the summer schools, but also at NCAR when I've been visiting. Um, uh, particularly Denver Water and and others, and really thinking about that 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 it's key to actually work with these partners, um, and I I I really embed that within my work now. This is an example of some some work that we did um, using the UK CP18, the latest climate projections um, for the UK, with with again Lizzie Kendall at the Met Office um, and uh, colleagues at the University of Exeter, to but but but. I suppose the important thing, working very closely with stakeholders in the water industry in the UK to actually produce uplifts for rainfall for climate change. Um, and these are, are, have been immediately taken and used in urban drainage design um, guidance by the Environment Agency in the UK because we've worked so closely with them to develop them. And so it's really important that we do this as scientists. Um, the other thing is that um, I think incorporating information on exposure and vulnerability and really thinking about how we use um, models is really important. And this also translates through to climate models as well, because I think that a lot of the models we use are not actually um, predictive in the right way, and it's particularly in hydrology, which is my main field. Um, we don't hey, actually Haley. use, if, yeah. If you could wrap up soon, that would be great, thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, I'll carry on. So um, key user questions, very important. I think, again, Linda's really taught me about the need to, to work with users and to think about user questions. Um, so I'll just to, to finish, um, I'm not convinced that climate models will ever provide all the answers we need. I think that too many people use them blindly. Um, but I think that one of the things that, that Linda's group um, and Linda herself has taught me is really thinking about how we integrate information from, from different sources 
to actually put an emphasis on variability and extremes. Um, and I think that things like storylines and causal networks are, are a good way to do this. Um, but I think at the moment, they still don't have enough emphasis on that vulnerability part and that decision-making part in terms of actually developing the storylines themselves. Um, and I think it would be it would be very nice if we could think more about um, this this um, decision making context for storylines of plausible extreme events. And just giving an example of of something we've put together for the UK for a four degree warming, um, where we can basically take information from different types of models, from um, changes in um, observations, etc. But again, this is very much the science, and I think the important thing is having that narrative as well that puts it together with um, with that societal context and the vulnerability and exposure um, context. So in terms of your legacy, Linda, um, I think that um, for me, um, it's been about partnership working um, and it's key. This is really key. And this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, focus is really key to increasing societal climate resilience. And I think the other thing is um, that integrating across lots of different types of models, um, observations, and other disciplines is really key to actually addressing uncertainty. Uh, I think for me, ISI was well ahead of its time. Um, it's only now that people are starting to catch up and think in the same way, actually. Um, and so this was the uncertainty crew that, um, that the co-chairs for the um, ASP symposium in 2014. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to Linda for everything. And I'm sorry I can't be there today in person.